thanks for being with us, Bross. It's great to have you with us to talk about um, where things have progressed with climate change. Uh, some 10 years really since the Garneau Review was released. I guess the first question for me is um, how do you think the debates progressed uh, in the 10 years since you handed your review over to the government? Well, I'm not sure you'd use the word progressed about it, except in time. That was a bit of a golden time for discussion of these things when all governments, uh, state, territory and commonwealth, were uh, working in a single project to try to get the best outcomes and uh, that was supported by the opposition of the day. From the end of 2009, a year or so after my report came out, but before the main recommendations had been legislated, uh, it became uh, a partisan political matter that divided uh, leaders and divided Australians. So uh, uh, that was a major turning point. Uh, and since then it's been very difficult to, to have uh, discussion of the issues. But it, it also feels to me like momentum in the broader community uh, f towards climate change and, and a response to climate change has sort of dissipated a little bit as well. Is that your sense uh, or do you, do you attribute it mainly to sort of the political conversation that's being had? Oh, I think that the, there's a certain proportion of Australians who take their lead from uh, the major the leaders of the major political parties. But I don't think the community as a whole has ever um, stopped taking this issue very seriously. That is why, despite uh, the, the uh, peculiar uh, media landscape, despite the vested interest, despite the political contention, you still get strong majority support for uh, d doing more and not less about renewable energy. How do you think Australia is positioned relative to the rest of the world? I mean, you've talked about the US briefly, but um, how has the rest of the world advanced its approaches to climate change, emissions reduction, and how are you seeing Australia relative to that and its contribution to emissions reductions? I think you have to draw a distinction between uh, policy, what governments have helped to do, and uh, reality on the ground. And Australia is in a stronger position, a better position on reality on the ground, simply because we can generate solar and wind energy more cheaply than other developed countries and and so uh, uh, developments within the private sector are driving a lot of change. Mm -hmm. But on policy, uh, I don't think there's any country that's had similar incoherence. So do you think, I mean, obviously your review uh, mapped out the principles and the approach for an emissions trading scheme and a price on carbon. Is your view that that's still the best approach for Australia and how do you reconcile that with the policies that we have in place now? Oh, it's the best approach. It's a, it's the way we would make the necessary transition most cheaply. Mm. I used to say uh, at lowest at, at lowest cost. Uh, now I would say with mac with maximum advantage. Uh, one thing that's changed since I did the very detailed modelling uh, of the energy transition. Uh, 10 and 11 years ago is that uh, the cost of the new technologies has fallen far more rapidly than we anticipated. Mm -hmm. So uh, in all of my advice, so based on the modelling, I was saying there's a cost to this transition but we have to make it and the cost is worth paying because the cost of not doing anything is much greater. Uh, the cost of unmitigated climate change is much greater than the, the, the cost of the uh, adjustment. With the benefit of hindsight, um, you look back at your review now, would you have done anything differently in terms of the analysis that you did, uh, the assumptions that you made, or how you communicated um, the results of your review? Uh, to be quite honest, Melinda, I think no. Mm -hmm. uh, we went through an elaborate process of public consultation. Tens of thousands of people participated in those consultations. I, uh, I can't remember a public policy issue in which there was more consultation and public education. Now, uh, some things were wrong. We hugely underestimated the, the rate of reduction in costs of solar energy mm. in particular, but also uh, uh, wind energy storage. But, but you say, would we, would we have done anything different? Well, if I'd known that then, I would have put more ambitious <laughs> and more optimistic assumptions in, but I don't think you can regret not having anticipated everything that happened in future. 
When you were talking about your review, you talked about the extensive consultation um, process. CEDA, of course, is interested in promoting good policy discussion and debate. Is there a role for us in trying to move that policy conversation and possibly getting to a, a better outcome in terms of policy dialogue in this country? Oh, certainly. Uh, um, I, I've written a number of times in the past decade about the importance of what I call the independent centre of our polity. Uh, people who are not representing vested interests uh, or partisan political interests uh, are talking about policy uh, because they're interested in what will serve the Australian public interest best. And I think CEDA plays an essential role in that. It has done for a long time, has done it through, throughout my professional life. One last question on energy, if I can. Um, the National Energy Guarantee, I mean, how important do you see that as a, as a policy uh, in, in the uh, emissions reduction and energy security uh, context? Uh, well, the, the idea of making sure that we've got policies in place that provide systematic incentives to reduce emissions is an important one, and that's one element of the National Energy Guarantee. The idea that we need uh, um, policies and regulatory arrangements that give us energy reliability is an important objective, that's another element of the National Energy Guarantee. Uh, I think that uh, we're a fair way down the track in putting in place a combination of security and reliability uh, support uh, uh, through uh, the established regulatory mechanisms, especially through a uh, sophisticated approach by AEMO in, in, uh, to its responsibilities. Uh, but uh, the, the, the NEG serves a purpose in uh, reminding us that we need systematic incentives both to reduce emissions and to improve reliability. Well, Ross Garner, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure and I look forward to talking with you again in 10 years' time so we can reflect on where we are with uh, policy then. Thank you very much.